Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Woolton in London, and I'm delighted to welcome you to The Art of Collecting, part of the Sotheby's Inspirational Living series in partnership with Intelligence Squared. Today, we are going to be exploring the collection of Michelle Smith. Michelle was one of Washington's foremost philanthropists who served on boards and committees at a formidable array of cultural and artistic nonprofits, such as the National Gallery of Art, the Whitney Museum, the Smithsonian Institute. This is her penthouse that we're looking at an apartment in the Ritz-Carlton, Georgetown, which is home to her personal collection, which reflects her discerning eye for art, including works by Francois Xavier and Claudia Lann, Alberto and Diego Giacometti, Jean-Michel Franck, Anthony Gormley, Edmund Duval, and Alexander Calder, amongst others. It gives us a glimpse of her singular vision for 20th and 21st century design, fine art, jewellery, handbags, in a curation that she could describe as determined and which transitioned into every area of her life. And I'm thrilled to have with me today four brilliant guests who will be discussing Michelle's collection, as well as exploring the art of collecting itself and how an individual develops his or her own aesthetic. Joining us from New York is Reed Krakow an award-winning fashion designer and creative director whose career spans nearly three decades. Most recently, he held the title of Chief Executive Officer of Tiffany & Company. And along with his wife, Delphine, he's been collecting fine art and design for the last 30 years. Welcome, Reid. Thank you. Also in New York is David Kleinberg, one of the most celebrated names in interior design with a global body of work wide ranging in style, yet always modern in sensibility. And we're very pleased to have David with us today because he worked very closely with Michelle to create her apartment. Hello, David. Hi, Carol, nice to be here. And Sarah Medford is in Long Island. Sarah is contributing editor at Wall Street Journal magazine and writes extensively on design and art and culture for publications including Architectural Digest and Town and Country magazine. Sarah, it's so nice you're here today. Great to see you, Carol. And lastly, joining us from Salzburg is Thaddeus Ropak, who has galleries in London, Paris, Salzburg, and Asia. Um, he specializes in contemporary art and represents 60 of the most influential artists working today. Thaddeus, hello. Hello, everyone. So let's start. I firstly wanted to know our panel's first impressions of Michelle's collection and how she presented it in her home. Sarah, Sarah, let's start with you. I think the word that comes to mind uh, first when I look at, at this apartment is really ref refinement. Uh, it's an incredibly refined collection and a controlled one, um, eclectic, but very controlled and at a high level, such a high level, there's really nothing of, that you might call filler. Every piece is, is worthy of attention. And I think the neutral palette that David has orchestrated here puts the focus on form and on texture, which is you know outrageously successful. I'd be maybe a little afraid to walk through the space with a glass of red wine, but uh, maybe white would be okay. It's really beautiful. And Reed, um, as Sarah said, there, there is an eclectic nature of Michelle's collection and how she Definitely. juxtaposed pieces from European and American Art Nouveau and Art Deco, mid-century contemporary all together. Was she a woman after your own heart? Because I think you and your wife Delphine quite like mis mixing different stylistic periods. Well, I think um, when I saw the collection, the first thing that struck me was um, that it was very personal. And I think that's one of the most difficult things to achieve. Um, sometimes it's easy to bring together important things, um, things that um, often are collected um, as a grouping almost um, in kind of a predictable way. And what I loved about the collection 
love about the collection is that it's it's a mix of unexpected uh, works, uh, whether it's contemporary art or it's the work of Lalanne, uh, Giacometti, Franck, more minimal, of course, um, uh, Edmund de Waal, ceramicists. Um, there's a mix and sort of bringing together of these disparate uh, artists that typically you don't see together in one collection. And for me, that's always the hallmark of a great collection. Um, someone who has a personal point of view and that all of the objects, as Sarah said, kind of are worthy of their space, but um, everything is uh, sort of the sum of the parts or what make up the collection. So um, ultimately it's something that's deeply personal and, and unique. Mm -hmm. And Sadeus is a gallerist specializing in contemporary art. There's very little art. <laughs> on the walls, and I wondered what you thought about her focus on decorative art and design. Um, you know, remembering Michelle as a very sophisticated woman and very knowledgeable about art, um, I have to say I was a bit surprised not to see more works of contemporary art on her walls when I saw the presentation, um, because I remember her as a very engaged person um, in art. She knew a lot. She was engaged, you know, when we sent her a catalog, she was curious about the um, artist. So um, I felt a real engagement in contemporary art. And the collection itself, as you see, the apartment reflects um, maybe more her sophistication in terms of design, furniture, uh, objects. Um, but the few works of contemporary art, and some we were involved when she acquired them, um, represent also her very deep knowledge of it. Well, we have the right man here to ask as to um, why, why she didn't um, want to hang so much art and why she was happy to keep the walls relatively empty is David. Um, it's quite a considered uh, approach. And I wondered if this is usual of some of your other clients because it's a very bold decision to take. It, it was a very bold decision, you know, when I met Michelle and we began to talk about the apartment um, and how we were going to build it. She was very clear about certain points early on. Um, materials, you know, we always knew we were going to have stone floors. We knew we were going to have, a, you know, kind of plaster treatments on the walls. We, we knew we were going to have a limited amount of materials. There was always an edited point of view about the apartment. Um, and I call it an apartment rather than a collection because Michelle and I were always very, we were building a home for her, uh, you know, and, and the choices we made were, were to that goal. Um, and because she hadn't had a collection of paintings, but had a collection of decorative furniture and objects, she had the collection of Tiffany pieces, of Art Nouveau pieces, she had already owned that fantastic Milan crocodile chair. We began to talk about what would go into the apartment in this new iteration. Um, and Michelle was very clear that she didn't want to have, you know, she just didn't want to be a mediocre collector of paintings, you know, and have one or two to fill the walls. It just didn't interest her. So what was the, the first inspiration? Was it having the Claude Lalanne and you worked from there? Um, what was, what was the, the inspiration and then your process for both of you? Well, the, the, I mean, definitely the inspiration with the pieces she owned um, in her collection in, um, when she lived outside Washington in a home, a larger home. She was moving into Georgetown. So part of it was to decide and determine what of her, you know, what that she owned, we thought was appropriate and would be useful and could make the, you know, trip across the river. Uh, and then we, we kind of started to visit galleries together and we started to, I, I had certainly a concept and an idea based on the contemporary nature of the space. We bought the, when Michelle, I, I will always say we, because I felt like, you know, this was such a partnership, but obviously Michelle bought the apartment. 
um, it was a, a, a true blank slate, concrete walls, the staircase didn't exist, nothing was there. So we really had the opportunity to create the background for it. So we, we talked in two levels, one about the materials for the, for the envelope, and then what we would put in the envelope. And so we would go to galleries, we would look at things, I would show her and share things that interested me, she would tell me what responded to her, it was the true kind of give and take of, of sharing our aesthetic and, and what resonated with us. Do you think when someone's starting off to create their own collection, is that the best place to start? Is it to visit galleries, auction houses? Is that what you would advise people to do? You know, I'm a big proponent of looking as learning. Um, it's served me well in my life and I, and I continues to, and it would be the advice I would give anyone. Look at as much as you can. And while well, this may make me a bit of a Luddite in the world of technology, I'm a big proponent of trying to see as much in person as you can, to see the, quality, the, the, the finish, the proportion, the nature of the things galleries, museums, auction houses. Auction houses show you an endless array of, of things um, on a rotating schedule. It's fantastic. Um, you can talk to people, you know, talk, go to the galleries, talk to people, understand why they're, they're, they've been in the world they've, they're in and, and they will, you know, there's a wealth of information that they're waiting to share with you. So she obviously had an affinity for certain designers and had multiple pieces. Um, so how did she choose which designers she wanted to focus on? Well, we always knew, I mean, she, as I said, she owned the Lalonde chair. So we always knew, and I, I was a great fan, of, obviously, of their work as well. And so we always knew we were going to incorporate more pieces of Lalonde. Um, I've always been fascinated and a great a great interest in ceramic works. And so we became interested in um, uh, the works of Baynard. Um, I always loved his, his ceramics. We, we concentrated on the Africanist pieces because they, they fit, you know, they resonated with Michelle. Michelle was always interested in sort of oceanic and African art. Um, we and see that course, in her jewelry influence. as well. We do indeed. Um, and what's interesting also is there's a kind of correspondence between her jewelry and the furniture she collected and the art she collected. The Lalans made jewelry, Calder made jewelry, Alexander Knoll made jewelry. Um, so Catherine, there's a real. His... Indeed, his niece. Yeah. So there's a real, you know, kind of correspondence and a, a, and a real through line to what she was drawn to and what Michelle, what resonated with her. And as, as Reed said, and I think those are the things that made it a, a personal collection. Now, Thaddeus, I wanted to come to you in Austria and um, cause I know she um, acquired the Anthony Gormley statue from you. Can you tell me how she came to chose Gormley's stand three? Um, I think David said it well, you know, uh, looking and learning, and that's the way I felt. Um, I met Michelle, I think I met her at an art fair together with David, and um, she was obviously interested in the work of Anthony Gormley. Um, she knew quite a lot about it, but she really wanted to know everything, you know, everything you can emphasize or discuss in a in a, in a short period of time. Um, and we went through the different periods of Anthony Gormley, um, his early work when he started uh, with the material of lead. Um, and uh, she was very interested in the use of material and how he arrived at these block pieces. Uh, this period of the block pieces he did between 2005 and uh, 2014. And uh, this piece is exactly in the middle, it's 2008. And, um, you know, it's about Gormley's search for the body, um, but the body also as mass occupying space. Um, and all this background of a sculpture, all uh, the definition an artist is trying to fill in with the sculpture 
she was very eager to, to learn. And it was a process. It was not something she decided very quickly. I remember um, she got some books about Antony's work and she wanted to really understand how this particular sculpture is um, part of a bigger uh, context in Antony's work. And, um, you know, everybody is looking at art of uh, on a certain level of quality, not everybody, but somebody like Michelle and, and, and David. Um, so they were eager to try to understand how important is this particular sculpture within you know, the oeuvre of the artist. And uh, um, I remember a very engaging discussion about Anthony's work and trying to feel it, really to find out about um, his background and um, how he arrives at a certain sculpture and how he arrived at this very particular sculpture. And of course, once she's acquired it, it's um, where to place it. But David, will you tell us um, a little bit, because I, I do believe you kind of picked the place where it should be the perfect place before she had actually acquired the statue. <laughs> I did. I did. I, I absolutely planted the seed. Um, I have been a, a great admirer of the work of Gormley for as long as I think he's been making work. Um, and when we, you know, we, so we had our furniture plan and understood where we were having sofas and chairs and where the piano would go. And obviously the apartment has a beautiful view of the river in, in Georgetown. And um, I went to the far end of the room while we were quite a ways along in the design process. And, and Gormley's work is today, as was saying, is sort of, you know, a lot of it, most of it, so much of it is based on his own body. And I'm roughly the size of Gormley. And I went to the far end of the room and I stood there with my hands at my side and said, and this is where the Gormley will go. And Michelle, you know, kind of nodded knowingly, but we didn't discuss it very more. But as you hear, she, is, is that wonderful example of, you know, an idea is planted, she explored it, she researched it, she, it resonated, it, it felt right, um, she learned about it and, and then, you know, shared with me the piece she was going to bring to Washington and, and, and there, there he is, as he, as he was always intended to be. <laughs> And so you um, have actually uh, interviewed Ant Anthony Gormley about his home, haven't you? And I wondered how, yeah. if you could tell us a little about how he chose to display art. Absolutely. Uh, I visited with him in 2018. We were working together on a story about context, really, about that idea of space. And it's an enormous subject for him, just as the body, the figure, is it's, it's very much in his uh, set of curiosities to be, to be thinking about how, how his work is placed. Uh, when I made the trip up to Norfolk, England to see him, I discovered that he had a similar block figure uh, presented in the picture gallery of his home. Uh, it's a 1750 Georgian manor house uh, that he worked with David Chipperfield on to restore. And you can see the figure there at the end of the hall. I think that he often presents uh, his figures in landscapes, sometimes in the English countryside by the water, um, but they say different things depending on where they're placed. And of course, what you're bringing uh, from your own experience to studying the work and a few years ago, uh, there was a beautiful presentation of his pieces throughout New York City, uh, and they definitely took on a different quality. But I find the piece in Michelle's apartment really sort of convivial, and um, it just reads quite differently, differently to me than the Gormley figures did uh, at his own home. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, isn't it, when you, you take them out of... Um the milieu that they've been in and the other objects that have surrounded them, they look quite different. Yeah, um, but space is as much his subject as, as the body. It's really the body in, in context, so. And a couple of other um, important artworks in the apartment. 
um, by Alexander Calder and Kerith Wynn Evans. And I wonder, Tadeus, if you could tell us a little about those. Um, well, I'm very fond of the small sculpture by uh, Calder. You know, it's from 1966, it's from his late period. Um, you know, he was concentrating on, at the time, more monumental works. He was, you know, everybody who went to the Walker uh, knows the spinner, which kind of reminds me when I saw this uh, small sculpture. I like the way she presented it, you know, on this table as a single sculpture. It's almost a pedestal for this piece. It's about the perfect balance. Um, I think in this small format it shows called a weekly at its best and, and mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful sculpture. Yeah? I do like it a lot. It's beautiful. It's yeah. interesting she didn't have any called a jewelry because she was obviously drawn to his work. Um, so many other names, but um, no Calder. Um, and the Kerith Wynne Evans, can you tell me a little about that? Um, yeah, he's a, he's a great, very interesting artist and uh, he used to be a filmmaker uh, who then turned into sculpture, even if it's a neon um, sculpture, you know, he calls it a piece of sculpture. Um, he uses slogans from movies, I do not know which slogan or from which movie he took this one. Um, and for him it's always, uh, he calls it the balance of meaning, you know, he was, or he is Welsh. So he thinks English is his second language and um, he describes the process of translation. So in a way, the way he uses a quote from a movie, um, but the way it's taken out of context and then just left as a slogan on the wall on a, with the neon um, make, gives it a very different meaning. So uh, kind of decontextualizing it uh, creates, is part of this sculpture making. And uh, um, I, I don't know how Michel decided to go for this one particular piece from his oeuvre, but I think it makes a strong wall. It's very powerful, it has this wall power. Uh, we often look when we look at art and um, I'm sure it kind of dominated this this space or this room in her apartment. Mm. And as well as pursuing these great contemporary artists, she was drawn to works from someone like Lucy Ree, who showed that pottery could be elevated to art. Um, Sarah, I know you know her works quite well. Could you tell us a little about Lucy Ree? Sure. Uh, Michelle had about a dozen pieces of Lucy Ree's work. Uh, Ree was Austrian and she studied in Vienna at the same art academy that trained a lot of the Wiener Werkstatt artists in the 20s. She passed away uh, within the last 20 years in her 90s. And she moved to London in the late 30s and became a real force in the British studio pottery movement. Uh, I think her pieces are extremely delicate, extremely refined. We can see the connection uh, to Michelle there, um, but it's really the formal aspects of them and the textural aspects of them that I appreciate. To me, they really resonate with references to uh, ancient Rome, to Egypt, and of course to Japan. I think that they chime really beautifully in the collection with the works of Lalan. And Ri did use some gold in some of her later pieces, and I think that works very well here with the Lalan. And of course, the small size is really no impediment to your uh, finding them and loving them. The text, uh, the color is really powerful as well in a neutral space. Yes, gives us all the objects do kind of lend those great intense pops of color, don't they, in the apartment? Yeah. Yeah. And Reed, what were the standout pieces for you that are coming up in the auction? So there, there are quite a few um, pieces in in the sale that I was that I really fell in love with. Um, the uh, I would say we just spoke about the Lucy Ree pieces. I was I was really um, interested in them because you don't see such uh, a high quality grouping of of her work very often you find one piece here and there 
um, quite difficult to find really the best of her work. Um, and I think what um, what was compiled, this grouping, is, is really some of the best of her work I've ever seen. And I've been a longtime collector of ceramics, and Hans Koper and Lucy Rhee and, um, in particular. And um, they're really just extraordinary examples of her work, the coloration, the fineness of the work, the variety, the scale. Um, so for sure, um, her work is something I was really interested in, or am really interested in. Um, particularly um, in the ceramic world, the Bernard pieces um, that David mentioned earlier, it's really unusual to find um, a grouping as this uh, as well. Again, you usually find one piece here and there, but this is really a, an amazing grouping um, that really celebrates that um, particular period in Bernard's career. Um, the Lalonde work, of course, um, is something that uh, Delphine and I've collected for many, many years. So spent time with the Lalans about 15, 16 years ago when we worked on a book of, of their uh, of their work um, over the years. And um, Lalanne is, uh, it's, it's remarkable after, unfortunately, both of them have passed, uh, mm -hmm. passed away, but the success in the market and the, uh, the notoriety they've achieved is really something that's great to see. Um, the crock chair is really one of the great pieces, I think, in, in, uh, in their, um, their history. And it's, it's, um, it's exciting to see this particular piece um, up for sale. Um, other pieces that um, that I was really particularly interested in, there were many, the Franck cabinet um, in parchment. It's a really seminal piece of Jean-Michel Franck. It's really one of the iconic forms, the simplicity, the luxury of, of uh, the veneering quality um, of the cabinetry. And, and it's really, um, one of the most iconic Franck pieces to come to the market in many years. Um, it's something that really has all the aspects one looks for when collecting Franck and, and the simplicity, the luxury, the restraint. Um, this, this form, which is a form that he revisited over and over again, these simple boxy kind of shapes. Um, this cabinet is really um, really an exceptional piece of, of his work. The Tiffany, um, uh, well, another piece of Franck. Um, the Egyptian uh, lamp is really incredibly rare, but in really exceptionally rare in this terracotta color. Um, I've actually never seen it before. I've seen it in the white plaster once, um, but you really, uh, I think this might be, David would know, of course, I think this might be a unique piece. Um, and the fact that it survived and um, it's, it's so rare really makes it something that's really worth, worth exploring. Um, moving on to, waiting for the next slide, Tiffany. Tiffany. Um, her choice, the choices in Tiffany lamps are, I thought, really interesting. They're not the typical um, Tiffany lamps that you see often in collectors' homes. Um, you know, this dragonfly lamp that combines uh, the mosaic glass in addition to the dragonfly motif on the base is something that's quite unusual um, and really is above and beyond uh, the Tiffany lamps, as I said, that you typically see in collections. And it, it just speaks to the personal nature of the work that David did um, uh, with his client that, that every single piece <clears throat> not only is a well-known name or a star in their field, but much more importantly is, is a unique piece, a piece that really takes um, some sophistication and understanding of the body of work of each of these artists um, to really collect the best and mm -hmm. the most unique. Um, again, in ceramics, and it's something that that I love that ceramics are sort of the thread throughout a, throughout the collection through different periods. Edmund de Waal is one of my favorites. Um, someone who sort of, I, I, for me, crosses the boundaries between design and art. Um, it's hard to, <laughs> to know where to put him exactly other than the work is exceptional, and beautiful, and um, something we've collected for a long time, um, Delphine and I as well. Um, I believe this piece was commissioned for the space. 
Um, again, David yes, I think it was much more about it. Mm. Um, but really, again, an incredible artist, but the work itself is unique and refined and, and rarefied in, in the fact that it's something that was created uniquely for this particular interior. So mm. many, many things um, caught my eye as a collector, but also um, as, as a curator and someone who studied design and art um, essentially my whole adult life. I'm fascinated by the collection and the quality um, and the surprise of the way the collection was brought together. Well, like you, I saw so many pieces in the collection that I was interested in, but my focus as it's my subject was slightly more on the, the jewellery. Um, she has a small collection of Catherine Knoll, as we um, talked about, very um, inspired by African art. And um, I actually have a small collection myself, so I was very interested in that. And Catherine's a real artist jeweller. Um, I'm very inspired by her grandfather, Alexandre Knoll, whose ebony and mahogany boxes are um, in, in Michelle's collection as well. Um, and they sort of really resonate together. Um, briefly looking at the the jewellery in the auction, there were a couple of things that came to my mind. One is that she had examples from some of the 20th century's greatest names. There is Boivin, Suzanne Belperon, Cartier, um, of course, she's a beautiful Art Deco clips, diamond clips by Cartier, um, Van Cleef and Arpels, Graf, and it's as if she went on a deep dive into their history and then chose their most iconic creations. Um, there's the Minerte, um, the Bulgari, oh, those I think you're seeing at the moment, uh, a Cartier Eclipse, Van Cleef and Arpel Snowflakes, very iconic designs from those houses. Um, and then the Minerte by Bulgari. And this is an icon that started life in the 60s when Nicola Bulgari, an avid coin collector, decided to set ancient Roman currency into jewels and it became an instant classic. Um, and there's a fabulous standout Suzanne Belperon brooch. And then the, that's what you're looking at at the moment with Peridot, beautiful mix, Peridot, green tourmaline, olivine. And, you know, these really are the great pieces from the canon of Suzanne Belperon's work. And the next was how, the next thing I noticed was how unusual it is to find somebody who actually dresses like their apartment. Michelle's collecting was so unified that the jewellery really chimes with the objects in her home, um, in particular the Hemele pieces, whose um, textures, colours, very earthy colours that she liked, and they marry ancient coins with in contemporary works of art. And it's very consistent with her overall aesthetic. And as David said, there's a real dialogue of materials in her design choices. And I think this is so true of the jewels and the objects in her home. Um, and we'd, you must have a view on the jewelry from your years at Tiffany and having Tiffany. Um, been artistic director of so many of the Tiffany collections. What, what struck you about her jewelry collection? I mean, I, I think um, first and foremost, you, you hit on it, which is, um, it's unusual for someone's personal style to extend from the interior, their their home, to the way they dress or the way uh, the way they look at the decorative arts like jewelry, and um, it really is um, it really is a testament to um, uh, to the focus and and the importance of of design and art in in someone's life. Um, I was I was particularly interested in the jewelry that was made by um, some of the artists and relatives of the artists, as you mentioned, um, uh, the Knoll, Catherine Knoll pieces, the niece of Alexander Knoll, who um, obviously there's quite a few small sculptures and boxes in the collection. Um, and um, it was nice to see the connection between the works um, that were done by Alexander Nolan and, and again his niece. Um, additionally, it, what was really fascinating was to see um, the mix of jewelry um, really was similar again to the mix of decorative arts. There were some very um, 
sort of straight ahead Art Deco pieces, the uh, Beauvais pieces, as well as Suzanne Belperon. Belperon actually was uh, the designer for René Beauvais for a period. Um, and um, that to me really references some of the metalwork in her collection, the Le Nossier uh, vase, um, obviously the Franck work, Pierre Charot, um, all of those works that were from essentially the 30s. Um, there was jewelry that corresponded in that way, not literally, but um, in, in terms of when it was made uh, and the aesthetic. Bernard, of course, the ceramicist was being, uh, those pieces were being made at the same time. So I, I loved seeing this sort of implied relationship between the jewelry itself and the decorative arts. Um, again, just just underscoring the uniqueness and the personal nature of the collection. Um, but it was, it was, the jewelry collection is really as expansive and as far reaching as, as the design collection. Um, mm. Things from more recent period to back to uh, turn of the century, Tiffany. And I think also a great mix in um, uh, very uh, sort of important masterpieces like the Belperon, um, and the Cartier Deco clips, but also really um, accessible pieces like the Knoll and like some simple gold, mm. gold chains. Um, and Absolutely. she's got fantastic bank leaf cuffs, but it really is quite accessible. And I thought all the, the gold and diamonds, there are lots of sautoirs, long pendants, um, long chains. And it really struck me that for the fashion at the moment, the 70s, trend they're absolutely ideal you just have to add a pair of belted flares and some white <laughs> boots and bingo you're in absolutely. the 70s um good point but, um, yes um so the the we've discussed um the artwork sort of not hanging on the walls and the empty spaces but david there there was a a, a wall hanging by olga de Armal in the entry hall and I wondered how, how that came about and how that was allowed to be hung. Well, as, as, as I started to say earlier, I mean, Michelle and I had had a, we didn't have many disagreements, but we had some animated conversations in sort of over 15 years of sort of building her home together. Um, and, and what was going on the walls was always an ongoing conversation because, you know, um, Michelle was a wonderful example of a collector who will wait for the right piece and um, is not afraid of empty space. Um, but as a designer and decorator, my inclination is to kind of want to complete something and make it fulsome. Um, I had gone to Paris a few days in, in advance of Michelle to sort of go through the galleries and the dealers and try to do a little pre-shop. Uh, in anticipation of our going together. Um, and I saw this exhibition of Olga Dalmorel's work at a gallery in Paris, a furniture dealer actually, who also showed contemporary art. I was not familiar with her work, but I was immediately struck by these, these woven wall hangings. Um, many of her hangings uh, are um, woven and painted and have a, a lot of them have gold in them. This one though, I was struck by the force of the geometry of it. And again, it's, it's geometry and the edited nature of the visual quality of it. And so I was very excited to show this to Michelle. And I said, you know, I think I found something, it's not a painting. <laughs> and, and so she was intrigued by it because sculpture was something that she was always interested in. Her family had a, had a history of collecting sculpture. And so it was something that she was very comfortable with, um, which is slightly unusual for some people. Um, sculpture is not necessarily in everyone's wheelhouse. And we actually agreed to buy this piece because um, we always knew where something was going. We would consider the placement of something, where a table would go, where the Lucy Ree pieces would go, each one. We always thought about you know, where these would go, even if it was an impulse buy, it always, we never wa wandered around not knowing where it was going to go. This was going so to hang David, in the did you ever room. feel you were running out of space then as you kept buying? Did you ever think, oh my God, we've got nowhere else to put that? Um, 
No, you know, I started my my professional life working for Mrs. Mrs. Parrish, and Sister Parrish was very well known for being able to push one more chair into any room. So, but you know, these were not crowded rooms, and as Sarah said, you know, each piece of each piece um, in the apartment and that had plenty of space around it to appreciate it. Um, but Michelle was not um, in Washington when I went down to hang this um, this the the wall hanging. Um, and so she, she was actually in Aspen and we went, were hanging it and we were holding it up. And I said to the installers, you know, just do me a favor. Let's just try it here at the, in the stair hall at the bottom of the stairs and see how, how it might look here. And it was just, it just struck me that that's really where it needed to go. It, it took pride of place. It really you know, I just love the scale of it and, and um, you know, the, the diagonal with the curve of this, with the sweep of the stair. It just was so clear that this is where it needed to go. And I took a picture, thank God for, you know, phones. I, I snapped a picture and I sent it to Michelle and I called her up and I said, I've just sent you a picture. I'm not going to hang the piece in the, in the dining room. I think it should go in the stair hall. And, and again, just sort of indicating that the, the the kind of person Michelle was, even though we had considered quite carefully where this would go, she would take a leap with you. And she said, you're standing there. If that's where you think it should go, great, go ahead, hang it up. Um, she had, um, you know, she had, a, uh, you know, she was reflective and thoughtful and courageous and um, impetuous. That's a lovely con combination of things. And which became your favorite room in the end, by the end? Well, I would say the library, and maybe I'm doing myself a disservice because it's probably the most decorative um, room in the apartment. But, you know, again, we, um, we use the fantastic rosewood veneer as, a, as the, the most decorative element in the room. We knew we wanted a wood room. The paneling detail is very very strict, very minimal. It's a series of reveals in the woodwork. But again, I think the room is my favorite because it, it, it reinforces so much about the way Michelle went about things. As Reed um, and today, as we're both saying, you know, there, there's, a, there's a level of research and self-education that's evident in the selection of all these things, whether it's the Giacometti table or the Lalonde chair, the Chahot stools, the um, the Laverne table, which is a little outside the collection as an American piece. But, um, and then every, you know, the, the library of books in the room reinforces what the collection is. We considered, you know, well, we're, well, let's not put the books on gardening in this space. Let's put the books on decorative arts and jewelry here. And, you know, and, 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 and so, you know, it, everything was considered, but I like to think that it's my favorite room because it, it still to me looks so inviting and comfortable. And that was really always a very important thing. Michelle was a very welcoming person. And, um, and I, I like to think this room reflected that, that it wasn't, it wasn't done as a showpiece. It was, it was done as a home. And that sort of controlled thought that even the books, every book in the shelf is sort of considered and looked at. Sarah, I wonder, is that kind of, um, how does that compare with other homes you've been into and other collectors? Are they as thorough and considered as Michelle? Sometimes yes, sometimes uh, no by either choice or just circumstance. I think, you know, the fascinating thing about collecting is uh, obviously no two are alike. Uh, motivation, means, taste, and access to material all really come together to ensure that everybody's collection is different. Looking at Michelle's though, I was reminded of a few spaces I've seen quite recently. Um, the first is Donald Judd's architecture office in Marfa, Texas. Um, seems in some ways like an outlier uh, with Michelle, but I can say that Judd uh, really had an obsession with craftsmanship and you can see that in the pieces that he chose, an obsession with 
high design and with um, spatial relations between the pieces, there's a real sense of spareness here and a chance to breathe for this collection of furniture. Obviously he designed his own desk there, but you can see the Mies van der Rohe chair, a pair of Rietveld chairs, alto stool, Marianne Brandt lamp. Uh, so it's very powerful. It's extremely controlled as Michelle's collection is. Um, on a very different note, uh, Annabelle Seldorf, the architect's apartment in New York, uh, which I just uh, wrote about in January, she has a similar focus on material uh, eclecticism uh, as Michelle does. Um, you can see the Venetian glass, the Chinese classical furniture, contemporary art, and Eastern sculpture, often figurative sculpture. Everything is, is perhaps a little more willful and a little more packed in, um, but it is uh, just as refined. Uh, and you see the textiles in the foreground as well. Uh, on a completely different note, um, Jacques Garcia in Normandy, the interior designer at his Chateau Champ de Bataille, and Garcia has really cornered the market in the Belle Epoque ceramicist Clément Massier. You can see here just what is a fraction of his collection. This is a wall in the Winter Garden where he keeps his collection of rare ferns. And he has it uh, positioned with Victorian furniture. But you can get a sense of that mania that can grip a collector. Maybe David was responsible for not letting Michelle go this far, but um, I think that it's, it's a fascinating side to collecting that you often don't see uh, expressed, but here it is in Garcia's collection. Have you ever pondered on the links of personality between these collectors and the sort of psychology behind collecting? Does anything unite them? in their personalities, these people? Uh, I think drive uh, and curiosity, uh, absolutely. Uh, you have to devote some time. Uh, you know, money is obviously uh, important, but not critical to collecting well. I think you really need to have the drive and you need to have an endless amount of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering that um, Michelle's was a sort of trailblazer in terms of we've talked about mixing um, ancient with contemporary, which is reflective of what's happening now. And I'd love to know from all of you, in your opinion, what the next paradigm of collecting will be. So, Sarah, if you kick it off, tell me what you think the, the, next, um, the next sort of wave of collecting will look like. Sure. I think, I mean, trends are interesting. Trends in collecting have all, always existed and they're only becoming more powerful now, I think, because we live online and search um, as, as a function of how we uh, live online. It really tends to affirm your interests and your tastes. Maybe it takes you deeper in that direction, but it's certainly no comparison to getting out um, and pounding the pavement and looking at things in person, which is a broadening experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that all sounds pretty um, dire for collecting, but I do think there's a counter trend uh, that I've been seeing. And uh, we have an example of it, uh, the London art dealer, Robin Katz um, at home in Notting Hill. And here he is. He bought Lucian Freud's old painting studio. You can see the splatters still on the floor. Um, but Katz is outrageously eclectic in his approach. And he goes for really a high craft, high texture, high touch look. Um, and also something that you might consider willfully imperfect. I think there's a move away from perfection on the part of a lot of younger collectors. And these are pieces not designed to stand the test of time. They may last a few weeks in the space they're in and things may move around. He has some actual original Noguchi Akari lamps that he purchased um, from a dealer selling the stock of Steph Simone, 
the Paris uh, dealer who fo first showed these pieces. Uh, there's some contemporary Japanese ceramics. There's a sofa that belonged to Howard Hodgkin and that Hodgkin had in his studio and a photograph by Richard Leroy, contemporary uh, photographer. But as you can see, he moves things around constantly. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that's quite a current way to collect. Okay. And Reed, what's your view? What's coming next? I think uh, anyone's guess, I think it's such a personal thing. I mean, I think Sarah summed it up well. I think there's uh, there's so much information everywhere and, and you know, there's really no, um, there's no regional, regionalism anymore. You know, everyone sees everything, um, whether it's online or on social media or um, obviously you can, you can see every apartment that has Jean-Michel Franck furniture in it from the last hundred years if you, if you want to spend some time online. Um, I think there's a reaction against that. I think, I think Sarah touched on it, this lack of perfection lack of encyclopedic collecting, um, lack of predictability. So I think there's a return to much more personal environments. Mm -hmm. There's a return to um, curating uh, an interior and your life in a way that works for you and that makes sense to you versus um, it being dictated by magazines or um, or by, let's say, the leaders in, in the design world. So it's, I think it's getting very personal. I think there's an enormous um, embracing of the artisanal, things made by hand, things that are imperfect. Um, I think that's only accelerated in the last year or two with people spending so much time uh, at home. Um, so I think it's a combination of a deep understanding of how home functions um, much more so than a decorative stage set. Um, and also figuring out what is your, um, you know, what is your point of view that makes your home unique to you. Um, so I think for me, it's, it's all of those things. It's, it's, um, it's somewhat, I think, anti-academic. I think it was academic for many, many years. You'd see interiors with, you know, it was always Art Deco furniture and Tamara de Lempica paintings or Boutte de Montvel or someone like that that you would typically see, you know, and then it was Prouvé and it was always with Knoll, always with a certain type of, of, uh, of architecture. And I think now it's, it's people are really looking to create their own environments, much more, as I said, much more personal. Okay. Sadeus, very briefly, can you tell me what's coming in contemporary art? Well, first of all, I really agree with what Sarah and Reed were saying. You know, trends come and go, and um, collectors want to be on top of things. They, uh, but when you really think of the great collections of the 19th century, 20th century, the ones who really stood out, the ones who really survived, are the ones who were very personal, where people were really looking beyond a trend. And uh, also for a gallery, it's important if you choose to take a new artist that uh, you try to make this decision outside of just the latest trend. You want to really look behind of a career. You want to uh, try to understand the potential of of an artist and to see how you can help this artist to uh, get its footing in the art world and to introduce this new artist, it could be a very young one or somebody who is rediscovered, to, uh, to collectors and to the art world, to critics and curators. Um, I think we're having a great moment. Um, there are trends and there are many artists besides these trends who are doing strong works. I also feel that COVID-19, this period, uh, of difficulties of the last 12 months um, made artists do some of their best works and I think as soon as we will see these works coming into exhibitions in galleries in museums um, I think it's the artist works who will really make this engine going strong again and, and um, I think we are entering a really very exciting moment to discover That's good to hear uh, that's great new and Dave and David, I just wanted to know lastly, I mean, is somebody's collection ever completed or does it become sort of obsessive and addictive and that you just want to keep on collecting? Well, I, I, I'd like to think it's somewhere between the two. Um, obsessive and addictive sounds a bit much, 
but I don't think, I mean, certainly Michelle's collection was not completed. Um, I, there was always going to be another fair, another show for us to go see, another gallery exhibition. I mean, uh, so the I think the interest doesn't die. And I think if, if that stays alive and that stays engaged, then the collection was never finished. Um, um, the, I think that's the difference between collecting and decorating. We could talk on for this. I think it's so interesting, the idea of collecting. Huge thanks to Reed Krakow, David Kleinberg, Thaddeus Ropak and Sarah Medford for joining us and for their brilliant contribution to today's event and for Sotheby's and Intelligence Squared for putting it all together. Um, I hope you join us again. And um, in the meantime, um, happy collecting. And um, I hope this has been helpful to start collections or to continue collections. Thank you for joining us.